Hello there, calculus students. Welcome back to some more help on test prep. Remember, you're supposed to be trying these on your own first, then come here and watch this video to get your own help. Uh, so let's start with this first one. We're going to see if we can just plug in the number 2. Remember, with limits, you always try direct substitution first. Well, if you do that, you're going to get e to the fourth on top minus e to the fourth. You get 0. 2 minus 2 is 0. OK. So once we see that we've got a 0 over 0, now we can go ahead and use L'Hopital's rule if we would like to. Uh, and in this case, the numerator would become e to the 2x times 2. Now here's where kids make mistakes. Because the numerator here, e to the 4th, that is a number. And the derivative of just a constant number is 0. That's usually the biggest mistake. The, num the denominator is just going to become 1. You, a lot of times kids will accidentally put 4e to the cubed because they're so used to power rule. They see this thing and they just move the 4 down. That is incorrect. So this is what you want. Then you can go ahead and simplify this and plug in the 2. Number 2 here just deals with the product rule. So you've got the first piece here and then the second piece here. The tricky part about getting this correct, so this one's a Let's just, let me write this out real quick. One. Derivative of the first is 1 times the second one. I'm going to leave it alone. So it's just 4x minus 1. Product rule is addition, so we'll now say plus. And now I leave the first thing here alone. And I take the derivative of, multiply by the derivative of the second, which is going to be 1 over 2 square root of 4x minus 1 times the derivative of the inside, which is 4. OK, so now you've got some things going on here. You want to uh, reduce this, so like that 2 can become a 1. The 4 can become a 2, so it simplifies a little bit. And then you will want to multiply top and bottom by the square root of 4x minus 1. Because if you do that with this first fraction here, 4x minus 1, uh, and this is all over 1. If you do that here, then you'll have to get the same denominators. And that's what you want, have the same denominators in order to add two things together that are fractions. This one's not too bad. You're just looking at the graph. Uh, so we're just going to say, which of the following states about f is true? So be careful that you're figuring out, is it saying false or is it saying true? So it might be best to go ahead and go along these and just write a true or false on each one and then circle the one that's true. Sometimes you might accidentally get two trues. And then that means you made a mistake. So f of a exists. Here's where our letter a is. Does a y value exist? No, it doesn't. It's just talking specifically about a y value. So that one is false. Uh, the limit as x approaches a of, of f of x equals 2. So here's the, the x value of a. Does the limit approach a y value of 2? Yes, it does. It doesn't have to have an exact dot there, but it's just approaching 2. So this one should be our answer true. But let's verify that these other three are false just so we're secure about that. Uh, the limit as x approaches b equals 1. Well, no, because here's b. The limit on the left side going here is different than the limit on the right side. Since they're not approaching the same place, there isn't a limit. So that one can't be true. So that's false. Uh, letter d, we just answered that. We just did that same thing. So that one's also false. And then f is continuous at x equals 0. So at x equals 0, it is not continuous. Yes, the graph exists, but you'd have to lift your pencil. So therefore, that one is also false. Yep, good. There's our answer. Number four is a bit of a tricky one. In fact, I would appreciate if some of you, I'm going to explain something, and if you've got a good explanation for what's going on, I'd love to see it in the comments on uh, this YouTube video. So part A says the limit. Oh, wait. First, we're trying to find out which ones are true, right? We're looking for which ones are true. So we'll go through and say true or false. Um, but the thing here is let f be a function defined for all real numbers. If it's defined for all real numbers, that means the function exists all over the place. For all real numbers, the function exists. But we'd have to say, uh, let, me, let me say this. Basically, def defined does not mean the function is continuous. OK, so don't get those confused. Just because it is defined doesn't mean the graph is continuous. For example, I could have a graph like this, and then it jumps up here, and then it's a filled in dot, and it continues on. So this would be a function that's defined for all the x values, but it's not continuous. OK, so just keep that in mind. So the limit as x approaches 2 has to equal 7. Does that mean that f of 2 has to also equal 7? No. So the way I do that is I think of a counterexample. Maybe you have something like this. 
So it's approaching a y value of 7 from both sides, but maybe the dots above it, above 7 or below 7. Okay, so there's a counterexample. False. Part B. If the limit as x approaches 5 equals negative 3, then negative 3 is in the range of f. Okay, it might be. It might not be. Let me show you a counterexample of that because this is a little bit confusing. Um, same type of thing here. If, so let's say this is approaching negative 3. This is a y value of negative 3. So does negative 3 have to be in the range? No. I could put a dot up above it. I could put a dot down below it. And maybe this graph never, ever comes back up to hit negative 3. So you can see here it's a possibility that that y value is never part of the range. Range meaning the y values uh, of f. Okay, so that one's also false. All right, part C, I'm going to do this one last. I'm going to come back to it. Uh, part D. If the limit as x approaches 3 on the left side does not equal the limit as x approaches 3 on the right side, so they don't equal each other, kind of like this, what I drew here, this piecewise function, then the limit as x approaches 3 from both sides does not exist. This is true. This is actually exactly what kind of a definition of a limit is. Left and right side have to equal each other in order for the limit to exist. So that should be our answer, true. Uh, let's just double check this is false. If limit as x approaches 4 does not exist, then f of 4 does not exist. No, that's not true. This is not talking about a limit. This is just talking about f of 4. So here, down here, I drew this example. Maybe this is the x value of 4 right here. And the limit doesn't exist, but the y value exists. It's just up here. Okay, so that one's a false. Okay, so letter C here. This one, the answer key says is false. That I, I stole this one from a book, and I was just kind of using this. But I have a problem with their answer because... If you read this, the limit as x approaches 1 from the left side equals the limit as x approaches 1 from the right side. Okay, so what they're saying is, maybe you, maybe you have a situation like this right here. Uh, they're not saying necessarily that there is a point, so it's just an open hole. So I can understand that. They'd say f of 1 doesn't have to exist. It might not be in there. So they'd say, no, that one's got to be false. Here's my problem with that. Up here it says, let f be a function defined for all real numbers. It's got to be defined. So just this statement right there tells you f of 1 has to exist. So that's my problem with c. I think they made a mistake, and this one should also be true uh, based on this first sentence. So if any of you who are watching this has a better explanation, I would love to see it and uh, teach me about what you think this is supposed to mean instead. Because I would argue that f of 1 does exist because the function f is defined for all real numbers. Number five, the slope to the tangent line to the graph of y equals tangent 2x. All right, so we just want the slope. And remember, slope is just saying the derivative. So let's find the derivative. What is y prime equal? And then we'll plug in a pi over 8. So the derivative of tangent is secant squared of 2x. And then you have to times it by the derivative of the inside, which is just 2. So secant uh, is the same thing as 1 over cosine. So I'm going to rewrite this as, uh, let's see, I'll leave the 2 on top. No, I won't. I'll just put the 2 here. 2 times 1 over cosine of 2x. And then that has to be squared. So I'm going to take this whole thing and square it. OK, so that should help you out a little bit. Now you're going to plug the pi over 8 in here, which becomes 2 times pi over 8 will be pi over 4. So you're trying to figure out what's the cosine of pi over 4, whatever that is, take its reciprocal, square it, times it by 2. <laughs> okay, hopefully you followed that. Number 6, we need a calculator. Uh, let me show you how cool this is if you know some tricks on the calculator that will make this faster. So the first thing is to recognize what it's asking for. Whoops, let me pull that up here. An object moves along the y-axis with the coordinate position y of t. So notice we don't have a formula for y of t, we, the position, we only have a formula for velocity. Okay, so just make sure we follow that. If we, uh, it tells us we're only looking at values bigger than 0. And at time equals 1, the object is, what's it doing? Okay, so is it moving up, down, and is it the acceleration positive or negative? What that tells me is we just need to know the sine of v of 1 and the sine of a of 1. Okay, so not exactly what they equal. We just need to know, is it positive or negative? Because if it's positive, it's going up. If the acceleration is positive, then it has positive acceleration. So that's just all we're looking for is the sign. Let's use a calculator to help us. So here's what I would do. I'm going to go to y equals, uh, clear that out. I'm going to go ahead and type in the square root 
of t. Okay, there we go. So I've got it in here in my y1. So now what we can do is let's uh, quit out of this and clear that. And now we can, let's just figure out what v of 1 is. You just plug in a 1. So again, I'm only caring if it's positive or negative. So what we can do here is, I love this trick. If we go to the variables button right here, variables, go over to the y variables, the function, the very first option. Here's my y1, and your calculator can do function notation. If you just say, I want to do y1 of 1, that just means take y1 and plug in a 1. And what it gives you, 1.91173, blah, blah, blah. We don't care. All we care about is it positive or negative. So we got to remember that, that the velocity is positive. Okay, so now let's come back here and figure out, is the acceleration positive or negative? So here's what we can do now. Math 8. If we do math 8, we pull up the derivative. So I'm going to take the derivative with respect to x. And what is uh, the derivative I'm taking? Whatever I plugged into y1. So we'll go back over here to the y variables. Enter y1. Or you can just manually type it out. That's fine. You could do that. But I want to specifically know at the number 1. So by taking the derivative of velocity, that'll spit out acceleration. That one is also positive. So we should get positive, positive. Since they're both positive, that means we're moving up. So it's got to be B or C. And it's positive acceleration, so should be a D. All right, that's it. That's the last one here for this unit. Good luck on that master check and the test that follows it up.